You're listening to the Study Legal English podcast, the world's first legal English podcast, helping lawyers and law students become fluent in legal English. Hello and welcome to episode 28 of the Study Legal English podcast. I am your host Louise and in today's episode we're looking at how courts interpret legislation. First we'll look at why courts must interpret legislation and then go on to look at the different rules of construction and interpretation as well as looking at aids to interpretation. Then we'll do a recap. There is some extra material available for podcast pro members at www.studylegalenglish.com forward slash episode 28. And of course, if you want to find out more about this premium membership, head over to www.studylegalenglish.com forward slash podcast dash pro. You can even sign up for a free trial. So let's get started. The UK courts must apply the law that the UK Parliament has made. The laws passed by Parliament or enacted by Parliament, called statutes or Acts of Parliament, should be clear and easy to apply. However, sometimes this isn't the case and instead the wording is unclear and ambiguous. We do not know exactly what it means. This can happen for many reasons. Firstly, sometimes the parliamentary draftsmen who draw up the Act make a mistake when drafting and therefore there is an error contained in the Act. Secondly, sometimes there are new developments in technology or society which are impossible for Parliament to predict. Parliamentary draftsmen cannot anticipate such future developments and therefore gaps in the law arise. Thirdly, sometimes the meaning of words change over time and a new definition develops. When a judge comes to apply this law, the new meaning of a word can completely change the law. In all these cases, the courts cannot simply apply the law because it's simply unclear, Instead, they must interpret it. They must find the meaning. But how do they do this? What approach do they take? What rules do they follow? Well, in interpreting the law, the judiciary use a number of tools. Firstly, the rules of construction and interpretation. Secondly, aids to interpretation. Thirdly, rules of language. And fourthly, presumptions. In this episode, we're looking at the rules of construction and interpretation, as well as aids to interpretation. So let's look at the rules of construction and interpretation. Just to note that when I say construction, I'm not talking about something related to building, but instead construction can mean judicial interpretation or the process by which a judge determines the meaning of an ambiguous or unclear term or law. When a judge construes a term or section of an act, it means he gives an interpretation on the meaning. So, now that we've got that straight, let's talk about these rules of construction. In the UK, there is no single approach taken by judges when they interpret an Act of Parliament, but rather, over the years, three main approaches have developed. These three approaches are the Literal Rule, the Golden Rule and the Mischief Rule. So that's the Literal Rule, the Golden Rule and the Mischief Rule. In the UK, each judge may take a different approach in their interpretation of the law. Some people argue that they simply choose which rule to follow to get the best or perhaps the fairest outcome they desire. Let's look at the rules in more details and I'll talk about what these rules are, 
And if you're a Podcast Pro member, you will find real examples of real cases where judges use these rules to help you to understand them better. So firstly, the literal rule. The literal rule is always the starting point for judges. This is where judges give a strictly literal meaning to the words used in the Act of Parliament or the piece of legislation. It is an approach that was developed and became the dominant approach used in the 19th and 20th century. The literal rule approach makes the law enacted by the legislature, the Parliament, more certain and prevents unelected judges from changing the meaning of an act through a broader statutory interpretation. It upholds the constitutional separation of powers, recognising Parliament as the supreme law-making body, and also recognises that the role of the judges and courts is to apply the law. However, there are some disadvantages to simply applying the black letter of the law. Sometimes following this literal rule approach can lead to very unfair and even absurd rulings, which must then be corrected by Parliament. Next, we have the golden rule approach. If following the literal rule would lead to an outcome which goes against Parliament's intention which is contrary to Parliament's intention, or which would be absurd and inconsistent, then the golden rule approach means that judges can choose between the possible meanings of a word or phrase and even modify its ordinary sense. The benefits of the golden rule approach are that it allows judges to give a fairer interpretation than the literal rule approach. However, It is unclear when the courts will and won't use it, so it adds uncertainty to the law and arguably infringes on the separation of powers. Next, we'll look at the mischief rule. When Parliament legislates, it cannot create perfect laws and, of course, with technological advances, things can get out of date very quickly. Suddenly situations arise which are not covered by the law. Gaps and loopholes start to appear which must be filled. Instead of Parliament redrafting and reforming the old laws, which can take a long time, the mischief rule approach allows for the law to evolve and keep up with the developments at a faster pace. With the mischief rule, a judge must try to discover Parliament's intention when it created the legislation and then give a statutory interpretation which is in line with this original purpose. The Law Commission prefers this approach and suggests this should be the one courts use nowadays. And whilst there are many advantages to using it, for example it can close loopholes, At the same time, it does allow unelected judges to sort of, in a sense, make law. However, this approach of looking to the purpose of the Act is very much in line with the purposive approach, and this is the approach used by the European Court of Justice when interpreting EU law. Member states of the European Union also use this approach when interpreting EU laws, or domestic laws which must conform with EU law. This approach has gradually become more and more popular amongst UK judges. It can lead to fairer decisions, it is flexible and allows law to develop and to comply with EU and international law. However, of course, there are some disadvantages – As with the mischief rule approach, it allows judges to make law in accordance with their own biases and ignores the fact that Parliament may not have had just one single intention when they made the legislation, but rather could have had many intentions which were divided along party lines. So there are many problems and considerations which judges have to bear in mind when they're trying to find out the the true meaning of a law. So how does a judge determine the purpose of the law? 
This is where aids to interpretation come in handy. Aids to interpretation may be internal, also known as intrinsic aids, and also external or intrinsic aids. Internal aids are everything included in the act or the piece of legislation itself. If you listen to podcast episode 25, you will know what some of the parts of an act are. For example, the long title normally states the purpose of an act and the schedules can give further helpful information. By reading these, along with other parts of the Act, such as the preamble, the headings and the explanatory notes, judges can get a better idea of what Parliament really intended with the Act. External aids are those outside of the Act or outside of the statute or the piece of legislation. These include the Interpretation Act 1978, dictionaries, previous Acts of Parliament, earlier case law and context. It also includes reports from Hansard, which is the official Parliament reports, as well as the reports of law reform bodies and international conventions. Another point worth mentioning is the effect of the Human Rights Act 1998 on interpreting statutes. This Act incorporates the rights contained in the European Convention on Human Rights into UK domestic law. Section 3 of the Human Rights Act 1998 requires that in cases concerning human rights, the appropriate legislation must be read and interpreted in a way so that it is compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights. Therefore, of course, this impacts on statutory interpretation, as judges must construe legislation in a way to comply with human rights law. So, let's have a quick recap. Judges have to construe or interpret legislation when it is ambiguous or when developments have meant that there's a gap in the law or for many other reasons. When a judge is interpreting a piece of legislation, they can take one of three approaches. The first one, if you remember, is called the literal rule approach and that's where the judge takes a very strict interpretation really focusing on the exact meaning of the words which are written by Parliament. The second approach is known as the Golden Rule approach, and that's a little bit more flexible than the Literal Rule. This is where, when following the Literal Rule approach would lead to an absurd outcome, perhaps contrary to Parliament's intention, the judge can give a little bit of a flexible meaning to the word and perhaps modify the meaning in some way. The third approach is known as the mischief rule approach, looks more at the purpose of the act or the piece of legislation and is aimed at closing a gap in the law which has arisen due to developments, perhaps scientific or developments in society. This approach is the most flexible and is very much in line, if you remember, with the purposive approach, which is the dominant approach used within the European Union, which is really looking at the purpose of a piece of legislation and trying to give an interpretation which is in line with this purpose. So that brings us to the end of today's episode, where we've looked at the rules of construction as well as aids to interpretation. In the next few episodes, we'll be looking at some other tools the judges use to interpret Acts of Parliament, including rules of language and presumptions, as well as continuing looking at the English legal system and sources of law. If you're a bit confused about these rules of interpretation, you can find out specific examples of how these rules are used in practice 
by judges in the podcast pro material at www.studylegalenglish.com forward slash episode 28. You can, of course, also leave a comment or a question on the Facebook page, on the Twitter page, or, of course, at the bottom of the episode page at studylegalenglish.com forward slash episode 28. So thank you for listening and see you next time. 